Dag de Heave, August Falcher. Hi, hello and welcome. It's John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School. Today I am I'm starting my day with a mug of tea and conversations with my God as I normally do. And I thought I'd share with you some kind of thoughts and responses to a fascinating question that happened in our Irish Pagan School community. And that question really was, is the Dagda a sky father? So short answer, no. <laughs> Um, long answer, I will go into it a bit more detail and explain why he's not, and then actually give you his own words about himself from a translated story, which kind of, I think, clinched a deal. Um, so the first thing we need to have a look at is what is this this idea or this concept of Skyfather? Um, it comes from a comparative study of pagan beliefs, pagan structures, where there is this theme or this kind of reoccurring character or attributes that appear in multiple different polytheist religions or pantheons um, of a male deity who's referred to as father, who may actually be the father of all of the other gods in the pantheon, um, but also resides or is empowered or embodied in sky. Um, most famously, we have, of course, uh, Jupiter from the Roman pantheon and Zeus from the Greek pantheon. Um, but I did go and do some digging myself just to, you know, really tackle it a little bit back. And the roots for the term Skyfather actually come from uh, Mesopotamian mythology. So it goes very far back. And the earliest kind of writing or the earliest kind of reference to the term or translated term for Skyfather actually relates to an Indo-European mythology. And I, I, I have this down here beside me, so I wouldn't actually get it right, wrong. Um, and it comes from a Vedic pantheon. So an Indo-European Vedic pantheon and the Vedic words, uh, my pronunciation might be terrible here, please forgive me, is uh, Diwas Pita. Uh, which is Skyfather, and that's how it actually translates from that. So the term Skyfather comes from this individual known as Diwas Pita, um, which is an Indo-European root. Now, a lot of people that I have come across try and contextualize their understanding of their spirituality or the pantheons or the gods that they're engaging with by comparatives. So instead of like, you know, dealing directly with the lore of this one particular god, in this instance, the Dagda, getting to know him in the cultural context of Ireland, Irish culture, Irish spirituality, um, they try and pass it against something that they already know. And I did this the same myself. I absolutely did the same myself um, and was very confused for a long time as I began my path in Irish paganism. So it's understandable that people would say, OK, well, you know, he's a father god so you know odin is the father of all the norse gods so they must be the same you know his name is all one of his epithets which means great or ample father so literally the name father is one of his names and so you know it must be the same and the same for jupiter and and zeus who are like the fathers of the other pantheons of gods that they are actually in um so obviously they're they're the same and there's this strive almost to to go back, to chase it back to the oldest kind of roots that we have and then say, well, everything derived from that or everything derived from that one particular root. Um, I personally have a problem with that. Not that it's wrong to, from an academic point of view, like, you know, explore those roots, explore where the information is coming from, break down the etymology of the language and stuff like that and try and expose yourself to as much content as possible. Okay from an academic point of view. But when you're getting into a spiritual connection and growing a, a bond or a relationship with a deity, it's kind of insulting to diminish them or demean them by saying that they're just an evolution of something older. You know, I'll, I'll, well, I don't need to talk to the Dagda. I'll just go to older deities. I'll go back to Mesopotamian law, lore and, you know, seek out Anu in that circumstance. Um, like, a, I'm not of that culture. Like, I don't know if there is still existing kind of descendants of that culture. Um, so it's 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 a little bit of a flawed kind of process to do that in any other facet other than academically. Um, and that's where we get into the breakdown of the Irish language, like the Indo-European roots for a lot of languages, um, Latin, Greek, uh, I think French, German, 
um, and maybe even English kind of have a very shared common root. But there was two kind of there was two kinds of Celtic language that came out of it, P-Celtic and Q-Celtic. Um, and from an academic point of view, people try and rationalize against these languages and how they developed in those cultures and how that actually defined their spirituality or their relationship with their deities. What's found with Irish is that it doesn't fully conform to either P or Q Celtic, like, you know, um, and even the word Celtic is not a race. It's not a people. It's not a tribe. It's an academic term for a collection of languages that share similar roots or similar kind of common common structure. Um, and so that's where you get into that's where I, I feel it gets into a bit of a bind because people get caught in. You know, the academics is very important. We all, we encourage, at the Irish Pagan School, we 100% encourage seeking out the academic, seeking out the lore, learning the information. But that's only the first step. Once you have that information on board, then you are empowered, then you're kind of aware enough, clued in enough, copped on enough, hopefully, to begin to build a relationship with the living spiritual tradition, the living spiritual entities, which is these deities. Um. So to pull it back onto topic there, uh, the Dagda and this concept of Skyfather. Um, one other person we need to look at for the impact of this kind of centralizing belief or kind of, you know, blurring of the lines between pantheons is, interestingly enough, Julius Caesar. When Julius Caesar was conquering most of Western Europe, um, he, of course, was writing down his own treaties, writing down his own kind of martial experiences. And like he was he was many like many Roman emperors um, of an intellectual level. They they did document a heck of a lot. So it's really cool from a historic point of view to be able to see the information that Julius Caesar wrote down. But what we come across is Julius reference to uh, this concept of a dispatcher, which is in, in the Roman or the Latin that I think he wrote it in. Um, and he's obviously pulling from this Deus Pita um, uh, individual. And it's this idea of this dispatcher, this father deity. And he was looking at all of these different tribes across Western Europe and trying to collate them like for like. He was intentionally looking at their spiritual beliefs, their cultures, their pantheons, and trying to equate them like for life. And part of that was also so that he could begin the movement of colonization of those places by referring to their deities. Oh, well, that's the same. It's a disparate deity, the same as Jupiter. You know, so it's that, you know, yo, you're believing in your pantheon. Well, that's just another name for my God. And we have the same God. So obviously we need to be together. So I'm be, I might be being a little bit disingenuous here, but that's that's my read on certain elements of that. And that's where we get the the Lou being equated to Apollo. You know, there's a reference to Lou being sun faced, which, you know, from a cultural narrative point of view, just means he's a fucking good looking guy in that the sun shone out of his face. He was so good looking. Whereas out of context, that's then taken as, oh, well, sun and he's a god. So he's a sun god. So he must be the same as Apollo Um, where he's not 100 percent. Absolutely fucking not. Um, sorry, slip into my own personal frustration around that circumstance too. But that's a, a great common example, a great well-known example of the same impact that happens with the Dagda in this instance. You know, people look at him and say, well, he must be the same as or must be the same as. There's a, a Gaulish deity known as Succulus. Um, and Succulus has like the uh, his icons, his attribute is like is like a wheel, a four-quartered wheel. Um, and we know that the Dagda is linked with the turning of the seasons, the four turning of the seasons through his music and through his harp. And Succulus does similar for the Gaulish nations with the turning of the wheel. Um, but then Succulus also has a hammer. And with it, he smites his, like, you know, he's a he's a, a metal working deity in that way. But then, you know, his hammer has a connection with lightning. And then, you know, obviously another very famous deity who has a hammer connected with lightning is Thor from the Norse pantheon. And suddenly you've made a leap and a leap, which seem like, yeah, sure. Obviously, it seems logical that like Ireland and France might have had similar communications or might have had similar understandings. And next thing you know, you have the Dagda is actually connected to Thor and he's a lightning deity, you know, a sky deity in that context. And that's where we fall into this trap and this fallacy, because we're looking for commonalities as opposed to 
accepting that there is individualities and those individualities come from the unique nature of the cultures in which those deities are manifested and connected and and grow and evolve and change you know the deities are not static they're not like you know photographs caught in time you know they are part of the living tradition the living cultures the living landscape in in which they are grown um and their relationships to them are grown so it's very important for me in my belief to to yeah sure explore the academics explore and be aware of these other aspects of it but then you know embrace the uniqueness of each individual culture for the value that it has itself you know i would never presume to tell someone in in france that their ancient gaulish deities are in fact my deity and they need to like you know just start worshiping the dagda now again you know, I've worked for the Dagda. My job is to tell people about the Dagda, but I'm not going to start pontificating and tell people that they're wrong and they should follow the Dagda. The Dagda is a good guy. He'd be, you know, very helpful to have around. But there is that almost colonial, colonizing attitude to presuming that someone else's belief structures are lesser than mine, and that's what we have seen with individuals like Julius Caesar trying to enforce or to unify and trying to use like these commonalities and that's again another part of my frustrations with it and so when people today are like well obviously it's just he's just another dispatter deity oh he's the same as blah 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 I get first very frustrated because it's not just ignoring or erasing the cultural influence on the deities it's reinforcing a, a contextualized, colonized bias. Um, and that's very frustrating for someone like me. So um, is the Dagda a sky deity? Is he a sky father? No, he's not. Um, uh, other examples of that, like, you know, that on Olympus, for example, Zeus and all the Greek gods are pretty much living up in the sky. They're referred to as being in the sky. And only the greatest heroes can climb high enough on Olympus to reach them. You know, um, the same is said in many other kind of cultures and um, even in African cultures, there are some mountains that are sacred mountains because they are as close to the sky as possible. And that's where their gods moving through the sky would rest as they move on. Um, so there's a lot of diff different cultures who embrace the aspect of father being sky. Uh, and and then that's also where we get a lot of the Mother Earth thing, this 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 balance or this uh, binary aspect of certain certain things um of certain things so there are many kind of polytheist religions polytheism religions that believe that you know we have sky father and earth mother and it's their union that either cr makes creation happen or created all the gods or created humans um and that is origin story in all of those circumstances um ireland is not that ireland doesn't have that we don't have a creation myth in that same way the, the two of the Danon are descendants of a tribe, an older tribe that were in Ireland beforehand and then fled oppression and colonization <laughs> and then descent and, and grew in other lands, but then came back to their ancestral homeland. So we don't have a creation myth from Ireland. We don't have a, a sky father, earth mother kind of circumstance. And again, there are complexities and difficulties that go with the imagery of those um what's what's the divine couple aspects because not everyone connects with that either um, and trying to define either feminine or masculine energy by the world around us was very common and was very standard in many practices over our time but as we grow and evolve now as a species it re really is a lot less relevant and in some cases quite harmful to certain individuals um, who don't identify with a gender binary so um, or acknowledge that gender is a binary. I don't. I personally don't believe gender is a binary. Um, so, yeah, we don't have an Earth Mother Sky Father circumstance in the Irish deities. <laughs> we we don't. Um, when we look at the Dagda himself, he is a father. It's it's in his name. He is all our her, which is great or ample father. And um, we have him listed in the mythology as having multiple different children. And interestingly enough, many of them don't. We don't know who their mother is, you know, we like he has all of these different kids and foster kids, in fact, as well, that he raises. But it doesn't say who their mom is. And um, there's only one, to my knowledge, specifically, and that's Boan with uh, the birth of Angus. So 
it's an entirely different kind of cultural tradition around tribe and around like this this concept of tua and the tua itself the community raises all of the children not just a uh, a nuclear family unit if that makes sense so that may be why we we have a different kind of contextualized baseline or cultural baseline which is where we don't see the same like core figures or core kind of um archetypal aspects to deities in those ways so um there is one last thing i said at the top end of the video uh, that really kind of clinches this entire argument when it comes to the dagda and his association with sky oh um yeah sorry there is in the story where the dagda actually it does connect with this i'm going to hold up a book at this point this is harp club and cauldron a harvest of knowledge this is a, a dag the compendium a dag that collected works um by many different um amazing pagan authors and uh, individuals i'm honored to be in part of this it's it's something that was produced by myself uh laura and morpheus ravenna so it is a curated knowledge specifically everything focused around the dagda um so in the story where the dagda gets his magic club we have him refer to himself in offering guarantee for the return and the appropriate use of the club when he takes up the power over life and death. And he, as guarantee, he offers his power. He listed out his own powers and binds himself to an oath using those powers as guarantee. Now, this means if he were to break the oath in any way, he would be he would lose what he offered in guarantee, which is he would lose his power. So I have this marked here and I will just this in this book, we have the head of Diet to Gotham Magic Club. Um, and this translation is done by Morgan Daimler, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so I will just read it here. And it's like, I have knowledge of the staff, said the Dagda, and I've given you three your lives. Give the loan of the staff to me to go to Ireland. What guarantees or trust for us that the staff will come to us? Sun and moon, sea and land, only that it kills my enemies and brings life to my friends. And they gave him the loan of the staff to remain with him with that concession. So that is a translation from Old Irish of the actual story where he takes up this and him offering you know his authority that's what it is it's his authority over sun moon sea and land and we've seen in the birth of Angus that he can make the, the sun well make nine months pass in a single day for boan so he he can literally stop the sun in the sky and um, we have seen him in the story against the mata drive like the sea out of ireland uh, and use the club to do that so we can see the authority there with the land he can call upon the names of all of the mountains in the cosmic terror and cast them down against the fomorians as they kind of come to invade we also see him digging the trenches of wrath Bresh, so he's a land worker the thing that is actually not listed though i'm sure you've actually caught it already is sky he doesn't list sky at all so he takes up the power of life and death in the club and he offers authority over sun and moon, sea, and land. Not sky. So, with that said, hopefully this has been an interesting kind of conversation for you to join in or to experience. Let me know what you think. Like, jump down into the comments and kind of, you know, if you've anything to add on that, if there's anything interesting that you've experienced around this, I'd be delighted to hear from you. So, thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you very much for being with us in the Irish Pagan School community. And uh, until next time, slán. Look after yourself. Take care.